Hi, I'm Angela Antle. Welcome to Project Restoration. Come along with us as we visit several communities in Newfoundland and Labrador where restoration is much more than just preservation. We'll visit projects that are attracting tourists, creating jobs, tapping into creativity, and paving the way to a new future. Join Project Restoration as we visit the English Harbour Arts Association. We'll get inside some of Elliston's Root Cellars, a restoration project that has put that town on the tourism map, and we'll look at why church restoration is so important to communities. Plus, we'll introduce you to some of the passionate people behind restoration in Newfoundland and Labrador. Master Carpenter Mike Patterson in Upper Amherst Cove consults on projects all over the province. Mayor Betty Fitzgerald will take us inside Bonavista's restored Garrick Theatre. Colleen Hanrahan is finding a new function for a former convent in Whitless Bay. And George Chalker of the Heritage Foundation will dispel all the myths around those heritage plaques. Let's start in beautiful Bonavista, where the restoration of the Ryan premises has inspired the whole town. So how does that organization work? It's the town that is taking care of the restoration. It's not an individual matter. Is that how it works? Well, it's a committee that's formed. Uh, the Historic Foundation is a committee that was formed that all the people under got the same interest. They want to see this type of thing happen. And the town is a partner with them. And we put $25,000 a year into the project. And each year, if, we, if they need our help in any way, we, we'll, we'll go and do everything we can in kind or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, this group is the driving force behind it. And they're doing a fantastic job. And I'm proud to be part of that group. And you have standards that people have to meet if they're going to restore something. Yes. They have to have a certain clapboard. The uh, roof got to be done in a certain way. It, the windows got to be done in the same way that was there before. And if somebody's going to remove a house in town, they got to come and see us for a permit. And if it's an historic building, we asked them to talk to the historic foundation first because we want to see it saved. And we try to save as many homes as we can because we believe that it heads to our town. It brings people here to see the, the beautiful structures that we have here. And it's also creating employment as we're doing this. And it's, afterwards, they, those homes or buildings are sold. And then there's a business or a person that moves in and lives there. And we have several people that came from mainland Canada that's moved here and bought those homes and they really love the homes that they have. And all those people got employment. I'm sure they're very proud that we done the things that was done there because it created employment for them, kept them home. They didn't want to leave. Would you want to leave a place like this? No. <laughs> it's a gorgeous town. And why leave something like this to go away when you can get the employment in your own town? on how art classes are giving new life to a church in English Harbor and how the restoration in Port Union led to a major new fossil discovery and attracted a new business. Bonavista's restoration projects have created jobs and brought new people to town, but they're also improving Bonavista's quality of life. The Garrick Theatre just opened. When Project Restoration visited, the finishing touches were being put on the cinema and performance space. Wow, this is an incredible space. What was this before you restored it? It was a, it was a theater. Okay. Uh, cinemas was shown here uh, a number of years in the past. But then all of a sudden it was just idle. And Mr. John Bradley, who was the owner of this, passed it over to the Historic Foundation, who started to restore it because we believed that a theater was a great thing to have here in town. Now I noticed outside there's a sign on the front of the theater 
is a rather creative way that you're funding the, uh, the theater's renovation. How are you doing that? Well, that's, uh, anybody can uh, purchase a seat. A uh, balcony seat is $1,000. Okay. A seat down here would cost you $500. There's a plaque that goes on the seat to say that you were uh, one of the people who purchased that seat. And it's, you can have your company name or your own name put on that seat. Oh, that's a great idea. Now, this is a great space, but it makes me think, how are you going to heat it? It's huge. Uh, well, it's heated by geothermal, because oh, okay. if we go electrical, we would never be able to afford to keep this building going. But in, by using that system, then we will be able to keep it going, because it's way, way cheaper than electrical. That's an expensive system to install, though, isn't it? Oh, yes. $90,000. Okay. But it'll be cheaper in the long run. It will in the long run. It's so bright. This is beautiful. Yes, it's, uh, it's our uh, dome, and it's also going to be a meeting room. And there are other activities, I guess, that's related to the theater be carried out here as well. Fantastic. So, as you can see, we got a great theater with great things going to happen. Very inspiring, Bonavista Vista Izmir. But congratulations. It's really Thank something. Thank you very much. And I'm proud of the group uh, that started it all and uh, part of being part of it. Good luck. Thank you. Coming up next, Port Union residents find out that you never know what you'll discover when you undertake a restoration. William Coker's fishing utopia is an important story that should be preserved. And that's originally why Port Union got together to restore the salt fish factory, store and workers' cottages. That restoration ultimately lured a new business to town. When work on the salt fish factory is complete, Iceberg Vodka is moving in. More surprising than that, says Edith Sampson, is the accidental discovery of Port Union's ancient history. have just buildings here that you're restoring, you've found something else really unique. Yes, uh, there's actually, uh, about five years ago, there was actually a major fossil find in, in the Bonavista Peninsula area, and, may, and especially in Port Union, Catalana, Little Catalana area. And uh, the fossils are over 530 million years old. And it happened that we had put a boardwalk uh, just behind the factory, and uh, it was to um, I guess recreate the train track that was there because that's what was there and we had to remove it so we couldn't put back a train track so we put back a boardwalk and just as we had started it we found out about the fossil find so we kind of put little stairs going down to where the fossils are so that people could actually go down and look at the fossils because not everyone wants to go and hike out seven miles or whatever to look at the fossils but for the five minute tour we have fossils as well. <laughs> So you're really diversifying. <laughs> really diversifying. It's not just the history of Coker and the history of all the Fishermen's Protective Union. We also have the ancient history of Port Union as well. We have the fossils. So it's kind of interesting. Lloyd Russell is one of the workers restoring Port Union's many historic buildings. As well as appreciating the good craftsmanship, he now feels more connected to his family's past. You must enjoy it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Why? Well, I'm preserving my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and his grandfather, and I'm, I'm just preserving things, and I'm helping to do things that some people just like to be on new, right? I'm not too fussy. I'd rather do the, I'd rather do the whole. So help me, I would, yeah. What does it give to the community, do you think, to have, to have these buildings restored? Oh, it gives them a, a sense of, you know, well, my grandmother worked there. She was a clerk in the store. My grandfather brought fish in there, right? And this and that. They're just, just little things, I guess. But to me, it means a lot. And to them, I guess it means a lot. And also, it gives work now, mm -hmm. right? Because these areas, this area, Bonavista area, Port Union, Trinity area, there's really not a lot of work since the fish plants, you know, passed on, right? So that's all I can say about that. So it's good work. Oh, I love it. It's important work. I love it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Thank you. No problem.
Bruce Sweetland was one of the first people to put up his hand and suggest saving Port Union's buildings. At the time, not many people shared his vision, but he never let that stop him. The Cocoa Foundation was formed in 1995, mm -hmm. and uh, that's when we started uh, working towards getting some restoration done. And the factory at that particular time was the one that we focused on because he was in the worst condition. This building here? This building here. And if it had gone another year, it probably would have been collapsed onto the street. You must be so satisfied when you walk in this building and know Very you had satisfied, a hand in it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, like, you know, uh, at different times probably, like everybody, I mean, you get a little bit emotional about it because I grew up here in Port Union. Mm -hmm. And it means a lot to me to see the, uh, everything restored back probably close to what it was because uh, Port Union it really is like from the top of the hill up there to the shipyard site because that's what Coker uh, came and that's what he developed. Like everything in this, like I'll call it a compound, was provided for us. I mean, you, you had a job, like so, summertime, the children, uh, when you got out of school, everybody had a job. So, but now it's a bit different, uh, very different as a matter of fact. But uh, no, it's like I grew up here and it means a lot to me. And... Uh, I'd like to see uh, the whole area done, and uh, maybe someday, if, if I live long enough, we'll have it operational, something like Lunenburg or whatever, and, and you walk into the area and you see a period costumes and all that stuff, and people will be greeting you, sort of thing, and make it a working, like a working village. Mm -hmm. You come up here, you see somebody making a bit of uh, furniture, or you go downstairs, you see the paper being printed, or at least something, some activity going on there. And you said this is not just about preserving Coker. This is about no, much more than that. Much more. I mean, Coker is a, is a story. Port Union is a story. Like, and the FPU is a story. The stories that, Port Union is a story that needs to be told. Mm -hmm. And, like, my father and, and uh, all my relatives that worked and lived there and other people that lived in the community built this town. Coker was a leader. I mean, he, he led them, sort of thing. But it's more, I think, about the labor like the people that built, mm -hmm. built the community. Bruce Sweetland's advice to communities is never give up. Drop by Port Union and check out the amazing restoration work they've done. There's a story to be told about Port Union. <laughs> and the sooner somebody uh, sees that and does it, the better. Coming up after the break, as we travel the province, one name kept coming up over and over again. We'll introduce you to Mike Patterson, master carpenter in his workshop. Welcome back to Project Restoration. We're headed to beautiful Upper Amherst Cove now to find out why restoration inspires carpenter Mike Patterson. I've always been interested in uh, when I travel I go and look at old buildings and I've always been interested in architecture but when the chance came to actually participate in the restoration of, of old buildings it, it's it yeah it grabbed me uh, I think the Ryan premises in Bonavista Vista was our first really big contract and and it was it was wonderful you know we went right into it um, you know with both feet and uh, you know we built windows and doors and 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 actually got inside you know you get inside sort of the um, uh, anatomy of it and the whole logic behind it all and you actually see you know wooden um, elements that have been standing up for 130 years you know in, in Newfoundland weather and, and it's, it's pretty remarkable when things are done right and handled right uh, you know how, how, how good they are. You must feel like an investigator you must feel so close to the people who built it originally. You do eh? you see uh, evidence of uh, you know their markings and and it's really neat when your own logic coincides with their logic and and you can and it makes sense and you can see why they do these things yeah so to me uh, that part of it's really fun and and every time you take something on like we've done some neat projects around the province and it's always exciting when you get to go and investigate a new uh, building, a new situation, try. Often, you know, there's not complete evidence there of what was there before, so you have to do your own investigation and, and that involves understanding, you know, the, why things were done and 
what was available at the time and the era and who did it and, and uh, so that that's that's going to be really really rewarding really interesting for us yeah you were talking about how there's a bit of a revival are more people younger people getting interested in the heritage carpentry um, I think more people are doing the uh, there's more of um, a movement towards getting the work done. I, I still don't think that there's enough people doing it yet, you know, to meet the need. There's not enough information out there. There's not, uh, people don't really understand, uh, like there's been so much lost. So it's a matter of uh, reconnecting with, with um, these old buildings. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting when you think about this whole green building movement, you know, what's more green than the guy who went into the woods, cut his trees and, and, and brought it back and built his house, you know, and, and uh, uh, so yeah, I don't think they knew they were being green, you know, but, uh, but it's sort of a neat thing because it all ties in together. The houses are here, they make sense, they, they're very uh, uh, relevant locally and, and um, yeah, so that part attracts me too, you know. Mike Patterson says heritage carpentry requires a mixed bag of skills. Working in rural Newfoundland is is, is being versatile and, and being able to uh, to spread yourself to you know to all kinds of things and that's how we kind of got there. We build furniture, we fix old buildings, we build new houses, we do everything we can. So I, I think that uh, basically having good carpentry skills and good joinery skills, uh, the rest falls into place pretty quick. You know, if you've got someone who you know who has good skills, then they can be taught very quickly to do these things. Yeah. We just heard from one of the province's most respected heritage carpenters. Now we're going to go to English Harbour, where a church has been transformed into an art centre. And Kim Patton says it was Mike Patterson who discovered one of the most important features of her building. Kim, the church is amazing. When did the Heritage Foundation get on board with this project? Immediately. They, they were our first partners. They recognized the significance of this building right away. And it was thanks to them having a look at it and seeing that it was worth designating as a heritage building. It gave us credibility to go forward and, and do the restoration. Kim, I know it's hard to imagine now that it's all complete and it looks so great, but what state was the church in when you first came here? Well. The church hadn't seen any work probably in its lifetime other than the installation of a lower ceiling and that was for heating purposes, you know, during the energy crisis and that was a big concern for everybody. And that hid one of our biggest surprises because we had Mike Patterson come up and take a look at the building, you know, he's got a lot of expertise and before you take on a building of that size you want to make sure that you're not really biting off more than you can chew. And he stood up in the rafters and we heard this scream, holy, and <laughs> you should see what's up here. And that, of course, referred to double scissoring in the arches, okay. which is quite beautiful. So what was the biggest challenge for getting this project to where it is now? Oh, raising the money. Yeah, funding. But we were very fortunate. Um, we held three auctions in Toronto and we did a lot of fundraising ourselves. Uh, Heritage, like I said, came on board right away. They gave us our max, their maximum funding at the time. That was about $10,000, but now it's quite a bit more. So anybody who's thinking about getting involved, go after Heritage. They're, they're, they've got much more funding now. And uh, ACOA came on board with us, the province, INTRD, and a little bit of money from tourism as well for promoting the project. So there is something unique about the architecture of this church and, and the role that it played in the community, isn't there? Oh, definitely. And it was built by local craftsmen, you know, all hand planed. And uh, pe people think about poor communities, especially in this area, they think of uh, fishermen. There were certainly a lot of fishermen in English Harbour, but there were also a lot of cabinet makers, and it was known for its cabinet makers. So even the interior furnishings in this church were built locally. Oh, really? Yes. So it's a real community effort. Definitely. So how could you lose a building like that? I mean, you can't. I mean, the soul of the community is in that building. What are people in the community saying to you about the Art Centre now that it's operational? I think they like it a lot. Yeah, people come in and they have a look at the church and the, the response is, is really positive. The English Harbour Arts Centre has been offering workshops and artist residencies for two seasons now, and it's already making a name for itself nationally. Restoring a building doesn't have to mean turning it into a museum exhibit. When Colleen Hanrahan took on the restoration of Whitless Bay's convent, she envisioned a hard-working building that doubles as a conference centre and guest house. This 
convent and chapel, the Holy Trinity Convent and Chapel, was built between 1850 and 1860. It was constructed under the direction, supervision, guidance, and whatever by D Dean Patrick Cleary, who was the person of the Archdiocese who was responsible for not only the building of this convent, the church, and the priest house next door. Tell me about the stained glass window, that the one that you fell in love with that made you decide to buy the building? Oh well, it was, it was the stained glass window in the context of that chapel. Uh, the chapel has double vaulted ceilings mm -hmm. and it, they're just magnificent. You can't imagine that in a little place like Whitless Bay you'd find such a, a beautiful building. Uh, but this stained glass window, I had taken stained glass courses and I understood that, uh, you know, there's more to this than meets the eye and certainly more than I could ever accomplish. So I looked at this and I thought, oh my God, it's magnificent. Five feet wide, nine feet tall, a gothic shape, and uh, it was designed and made by Louis Koch in Beauvoir, France in 1890 and shipped over. Now he is the man who also did the Palladium window at the Basilica. Oh. Okay. So yeah, he's a, he has a history here. So I saw the window, I just knew it was of value. I saw the chapel, I knew it was just astounding. And, uh, and I have a real interest in anything heritage because I just feel it's, it's connection to yourself, it's connection to your community, it's, you know, and that's what makes Newfoundland or this community so special because I've traveled and I've seen the value of heritage, not only personally, but also economically. It is a real economic generator. And this, you want this to be an economic generator for the area. This is going to be a guest house, right? Right, yeah. And, well, the, our, our, initial, and our initial and ongoing concept is it's going to be a meeting center with overnight accommodation. So hopefully it can um, allow people to come and, and use the facility, but also extend the season a little bit beyond just tourism, but just to so we can use it in other times of the year. How many people can stay here at once when it's done? Uh, well, there'll be 10 rooms okay. en suite, we hope. That's the objective. It'll be amazing when it's done. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. When we come back after the break, one of the major challenges of any restoration, and that's finding the right contractor. Welcome back to Project Restoration. When Project Restoration visited Trinity, we were there to see the heritage plaque attached to Holy Trinity Church. Ian White called it a proud day for the community. It, it's, it's, it's just a small plaque, but to me it's, it's a large indicator of the concern and the care. Um, that an organization puts into designating structures. Mm -hmm. And you said when you were standing on the steps, you said that a lot of people were involved either by donation or their, with their labor. Yes. Um, there was donations from the local area. Uh, there was also donations internationally. Um, a, a man was here visiting and he saw the church and he recognized himself how important it was in some inquiries and uh, talked to the McGraw ladies who in turn talked to the parish priest and he donated a large amount of money uh, to see it restored to the way it should be. Um, and even the international visitor re recognizes what we have here. Eh? Yeah. A lot of time we don't see it ourselves. Um, the Historical Society um, with the work of, of um, our, uh, some of our employees has done, does the nitty gritty stuff. So they do the application process, they do the, the telephone calls, it all makes this event possible. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the McGraw ladies as well. They're, they're the ones, the family, McGraw family, who's, who's kept it um, operated. They've mowed the grass, they've, uh, you know, they open the doors every day so tourists uh, can come in and, and see the church for what it is. Mm -hmm. so it, it, it takes a lot of local involvement to, to make this work, eh? George Chalker is the executive director of Newfoundland and Labrador's Heritage Foundation. He says churches are important not only because of their spiritual role, but also because they showcase the community's building skills. Why are churches important? Churches are important because in all rural communities there's at least one church. 
And these buildings were the pride and joy of the community. They represented the best in the craftsmanship that that community could provide. And quite frequently, it was people in the community that built their own churches. They might have hired one lead carpenter, mm -hmm. uh, and they've all left their own mark, even though they might represent, for instance, a Gothic revival style. There are elements that are unique to that building and unique to that community because that is how it was interpreted locally. Uh, some of the grander churches, uh, larger ones in St. John's, uh, these are formal architecture. Uh, they represent sort of the mother church, if you could call it that. Right. And uh, these are very formal architecture. Uh, and, and whereas in rural Newfoundland, they are more of a folk or vernacular architecture or an interpretation of a formal style. So there's something fanciful about them. Very much so. This church in Brigus made headlines a couple of years ago when it went on the market. Sue Ann Pye says almost losing St. George's galvanized the community. What do you do in St. George's Heritage Church to make it a sustainable place? Uh, we have concerts uh, throughout the tour season. Uh, we usually kick off uh, on St. George's Day, which is um, toward the end of April. Yeah. And we usually have local performers then. And then throughout the year, uh, we partner with other festivals like the Tuckamore Festival and Shalloway. And uh, the Newfoundland Labrador Folk Festival kicked off their, their um, festival this year here with uh, Alan Stewart and Jerry O'Byrne. Why is it important to restore churches? Um, well, first of all, it's the history, obviously. I mean, there's, um, it's a place where a lot of um, personal milestones take place, uh, funerals, weddings, christenings, but also the, um, the particular land that they're built on. Um, hold a significance and people often don't want to see those particular pieces of land uh, cut off from public use. And um, we all have a place in history and it doesn't, it, just because you want to restore something doesn't mean that you want to stagnate and you don't want to develop but it's very important to also hang on to where you were and how far you've come. So it's very important to move forward but to also know where you've come from. The Heritage Foundation understands the challenges of diving into a restoration. George Chalker says he wants to dispel some of the myths around those heritage plaques. What is the biggest myth about the plaque? A lot of people feel if they seek designation and they receive a plaque, in essence, they lose ownership of the building. They feel that it becomes public property. And this is most incorrect. Really, the plaque is there to, to denote the building as being important historically and architecturally to the, the, the built heritage of the province. What kinds of support can the Heritage Foundation offer people? Well, the first and the biggest uh, element of support that we can provide is we can pro provide actually a very nice grant and at the present time, that grant is to a maximum of $30,000, and it's cost shared. So for every dollar that you put into the building or the structure, we will match it with a dollar up to a maximum of $30,000 on our part. Next up on Project Restoration, how a telegraph station became the most important public building in Bay Roberts. This building was not historically a gathering place, it was a telegraph station, but it now holds the Bay Roberts Town Hall, meeting rooms, a community museum, and the Christopher Pratt Art Gallery. Betty Jarrett is involved in the community museum, now housed on the second floor of the former telegraph station. Betty, this is fantastic. You've got a printing shop. You've got a clothing store. Out here, you've got a cooperage. 
This is just jam-packed with artifacts. Where did they all come from? Oh, individuals in the community. And uh, in the beginning, they were a bit hesitant to bring them in to us, but uh, oh, when they saw what kind of a museum we had, they figured they were gonna have a good home here, so we're delighted. Oh, good. So you're still getting donations? Still getting donations weekly. I had one brought in yesterday, actually. So our policy is, if we already have it, we don't take it. But if it's something interesting and new, yes, we take it. And I, what I like about it, too, is that it's not just about the objects, but you have the families who were involved with the different shops? Yes, and, and that was uh, for a reason. Uh, our museum is on the theme of commerce, and we wanted to do the families that had the businesses here. Yeah. And that's what we've tried to do, is relate the artifact to the business. You must be so proud, it's beautiful. Oh, we are so proud. And we have people from all over the world say, for a community museum of its size, it's lovely. This building is now a national historic site, but Eric Jarrett says it was a bit of a battle convincing others to share his vision. This building was built in 1913 by the Western Union Company as a repeater station for cables going from England through to New York, actually, oh, okay. and 1927 was an extension put on. It's such a solidly built brick building. It has such a presence in the town, but it wasn't always like that, was it? Mostly the frame itself is done with reinforced concrete and then covered with uh, terracotta and brick outside. Outside the brick veneer, these brick were brought from England, they're very porous, so they absorb moisture and they freeze and they spall. So there was, yes, there were brick falling, actually literally falling off the building. There were cracks in the building. It was becoming a liability. And that's when you stepped in. <laughs> we did. Uh, we wanted to rescue the building because of its historic significance and a beautiful building too, of course. I wasn't looking very beautiful at the time with the bricks falling off, but we wanted to rescue the building, number one. And number two, we wanted a home for our museum. Okay. But this is much more than a museum. There's other things in here too. Tell me about it. Yes, it is more than a museum. We do have a museum and an art gallery, Crystal Pratt Gallery. Mm -hmm. We do have an archives. And very important to this is that downstairs portion is houses the Bay Arbor's Town Council, their chambers and their offices. And we have a meeting room, which we call a community meeting room for groups that uh, recreation commissions, Boy Scouts, whatever want to use. The Bay Roberts building is a perfect example of why you should have a long-term plan in place for your restoration, because the future is as important as the past. When we come back, we'll learn that not all restoration is about clapboard and shingles. Sometimes it's about rocks and sod. Welcome back to Project Restoration. Coming up, we're going to visit with Shane O'Day, a heritage activist. We'll go to Calvert, where a tiny house shows how the ordinary can be quite extraordinary. But first, let's visit Elliston, where root sellers, of all things, are attracting thousands of visitors. Sellers has attracted visitors from all over North America. Tell yes. me about this. Yes, um, we the first year uh, we started counting visitors, we saw 1,600. Um, last year we saw 10,000. Really? Yes. Yeah. And uh, like, there's a lot from all over the world. Uh, we have some tours, the Elder Hostel program. Uh, they can come here every year, sometimes three and four groups, sometimes more, depending on uh, the programs offered. Uh, they'll spend a half a day here in Elliston. They'll tour the root cellars, tour the uh, puffin site, tour the craft shop, um, go to the cafe. So there's spin-off from those root yes. cellars. Yes, oh, definitely. Colleen, tell me why Elliston is the root cellar capital of the world. Uh, actually, it started off as the root cellar capital of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, and did some research and we kind of find out that there's not as many root cellars anywhere else in the world as, he as here in Elliston. So we declared ourselves the root cellar capital of the world. 
why root cellars? There's root cellars all over Newfoundland and Labrador. Yes. Why do you have so many here? Uh, I'd say probably there's as many every, everywhere, but we kept ours because uh, Maverly uh, was later getting electricity than the rest of Elliston. So, uh, and most people grew their own vegetables here in Elliston and a root cellar was a perfect way to keep them. So, I mean, there's still people in Elliston that uh, grow their own vegetables and keep them in the root cellar all year long. How many root cellars are there? 133. And how many were operational? How many did you have to restore? We restored around 42. Okay. So uh, what do the elder hostel people think? Are they really that interested in going oh, yeah. in and looking? Oh yeah, they're fascinated by the root cellars. Yeah, they love it. So there's been a real benefit to restoring that unique part of your heritage. Oh, definitely. It's been, it's revitalized the community, really. Before we restored the root cellars, um, tourism was not non-existent actually in Elliston. Uh, now it's in the summer, it employs like 20 or 30 people. Okay. And uh, in, in spin-offs too, because we, now we've got uh, a restaurant, a couple of B&Bs, takeout, a couple takeouts actually. Yeah. And they're all open in summer months. Okay, great. Yeah. Next up on Project Restoration, most of us experience the joy and pain of restoration through a home reno. Mona Rossiter is feeling both those emotions as she digs into the restoration of her aunt's home. It demonstrates the importance of preserving the history of regular folk, a building she's treasured since childhood. It's my great aunt's house, and so it's about a hundred years old, or so, you know, and uh, she grew up there. Uh, her parents owned it, John and Teresa Power, and she grew up there, and then when her mother died, uh, she married, and uh, herself and her husband lived there. She passed away in 1998, and it came to me, and uh, in 2001 or so, I said, I think I better do something with this. So. Here's 2009, <laughs> and I'm doing something, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Did you find it was easy to to do something with it? Was it, what was the main challenge? Finding someone who'd cooperate with me, you know. I think, like they say, it takes a what is it, a village to raise a child? Well, it takes a team of people and willing participants to to want to take on a project to like this. Yeah, to save this house, right? So. Um, uh, that was the kind of struggle I had first, getting someone to work with me to say yes, it could be done, because it was in kind. Of, it had deteriorated, obviously, because someone hadn't lived there for a little while and a hundred years, and there were some renovations done in the 60s that didn't help the house. You know, it had made it rot in certain spots, right. so um, that didn't help. Uh, so I was getting that willing participant, and I found a great guy <laughs> who said, "Yeah, it can be done, and I'll do it." And <laughs> so, he's from this area. And he's from this community. Yeah, Jason Rossiter. Uh, I, there might be a relationship. We don't know if we're actually connected. Probably are somewhere along the line, right? Um, but uh, yes, he's been my kind of lead carpenter, and he's had a couple of other really good people work with him from the community too, uh, Francis Walsh and and some other guys that have helped. You know, so they've all, and they're all delighted to see it happen. One of the striking things about the inside, when you showed me the inside, was the tiny staircase. Was your great aunt a small woman? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you should ask. No, she wasn't, right? Um, but it is, yeah, a small staircase, and that forms the center part of the house, because in the center part there was the staircase and the chimney, and then the rooms are off that. And, and that's the original staircase from, you know, the turn of the center when the house was first built. And that would have been the type of staircase that they would have had. And I'm assuming, you know, they were smaller people at the time. Yeah. or Part of it too, I understand from talking to, to architects and that is that low ceilings and small houses, well, it was about heat, you know, conservation as well, you know? Right. But yeah, it is a tiny staircase and it's the original staircase from the time. And right? why did you want to save that? Um, I, I think I love the staircase. It's beautiful and it's traditional and I felt like if the staircase had been removed, the, the whole feel of the house would have been changed. So I didn't want to, that's why I didn't change like the layout of the house. The floor plan is the same and the staircase is the same. And so the same feel, you know, to that house is there. And I, that's what I wanted to keep, that feel to that salt box house, you know, low ceilings, narrow staircase, you know. So uh, it was a, it's a labor of love, you know, positively. You were saying that one of the reasons you wanted to restore the house is not just because you loved your aunt and you spent time here as a child, mm -hmm. but because it is a common person's house. Yeah, That's yeah. Well, I mean, and uh, most of what I've seen that's been restored or um, 
renovated. It's been kind of the merchants' homes or the bigger, more elaborate houses in communities, and that's wonderful. But there's, uh, I thought this is an ordinary person's home, and it would be nice to save that as an example. This is how many ordinary people live. This is the type of house they would have lived in. So I was kind of interested in that because I have that kind of interest in you know the architecture of Newfoundland and not the social history of Newfoundland, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's that was kind of one of my main reasons too. You know, yeah, it's beautiful. It's not bad. It's getting there. <laughs> <laughs> Shane O'Day is a Mun Classics prof and heritage activist. He's someone who connects restoration with Newfoundland pride. He points to some of the restoration success stories in St. John's. The Lily Building is a classic example of a, an old warehouse building now being turned over to a social purpose. And that was absolutely critical to our vision. This was not to be an elite operation putting the wealthy in heritage houses. It was to be a generalized operation putting social housing in the downtown, putting social housing throughout the city, and developing buildings so that people could be proud of where they live. What's happening in Labrador? Well, you know, Labrador is a very scattered, uh, for the most part, coastal community. But there are two quite staggeringly wonderful sites up there. Battle Harbor has a superb fishery station, mostly 19th century, possibly some 18th century buildings. And that has been wonderfully preserved by the Battle Harbor Historic Trust. And even though you think this is an impossible situation, they are generating a fair bit of tourism up there. And that is really very important to draw people up the Northern Peninsula, across the Straits, over onto the Labrador shore. Beyond that, further up the coast, up at Hopedale, you have the magnificent Moravian mission buildings at Hopedale. Um, the station dates back to the 1780s, but the buildings are principally, you know, mid 19th century, some a little bit earlier than that. But there are magnificent collection of buildings. That's another, in a way, ecclesiastical district, but on the coast of Labrador by a totally different culture, um, part Inuit, part German, part English. And the buildings are themselves preserved exactly as they were with their wonderful libraries and their whole townscape. Tell us about some of the success stories here in St. John's. Well, classically, it is the Heritage Conservation Area. Mm -hmm. um, that was an area that had very seriously died after Confederation. The houses have become run down, uh, multiple uses, multiple poor uses. And the Newfoundland Historic Trust fostered the development of the St. John's Heritage Foundation. And in combination with the NIP programs, we developed a lot of houses in the downtown, which then suddenly made people pay attention to the downtown. I mean, there was a cabinet minister who said in the 1970s, what do you want to see the harbor for anyway? Well, now that's all anybody wants to see is the harbor out of the back windows. And so it generated an image for St. John's, which is intensely positive, And that image has now spread from St. John's across the whole of Newfoundland and Labrador. And heritage activities are building heritage activities are occurring in virtually every community. Well, what do you say to people who say you're you know, dwelling on the past, you're, you're just celebrating the, what was? Uh, I am dwelling on the past and I am celebrating what was. But that is a way into the future. It, it, it has meant an immense amount of money going into the economy. It has meant an immense revaluing of Newfoundland as a place worthy of being looked at in and of itself. And we did not have that for a long time after Confederation. We've put the value back in the culture of Newfoundland. And very much, you know, obviously the LSPU Hall and the, the artistic community did it, but also architectural heritage has had a major role to play in all that. It's been an allied art. Thanks for joining us here on Project Restoration. I hope we've shown you that restoration is more than just preserving the past. It can ignite creativity, foster entrepreneurism, and really bring communities together. 
Contact the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador if you have a building you'd like to restore. They can set you up with funding and resources and have that building recognized as part of our heritage. Welcome, <laughs> Welcome to Elliston Root Cellar, capital of the world. Is that a little bit too over the top? Good thing I'm not claustrophobic. Welcome to Elliston Root Capital. <laughs>